Welcome to the Compounders Podcast, where we explore the anatomy of public company wealth creation stories. On this show, we invite you to be a fly on the wall for the actual conversations professional investors have with public company CEOs. I'm your host, Ben Claremont, a partner and portfolio manager at Cove Street Capital. In these conversations, I interview senior executives by posing the exact questions I ask as part of Cove Street's diligence process. Whether you are a professional investor, founder, or someone who is simply interested in business, we think this podcast has something for you. This season of Compounders, The Anatomy of a Multibagger is sponsored by Tegas. Tegas is an innovative and disruptive company that is changing the way professional investors work. For more information, please visit their site at tegas.co. All opinions expressed by your hosts and the podcast guests are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Cove Street Capital or any affiliates. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not investment advice and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions. We are not recommending the purchase or sale of any securities. The hosts and guests may be beneficial owners of the securities discussed. You should not assume that the securities discussed are or will be profitable. My guest on the show today is Chris Mayer, the portfolio manager of the Woodlock House Family Capital Fund and the co-founder of the firm. He is also the author of 100 Baggers, Stocks That Return 100 to 1 and How to Find Them. You will notice that we are doing something a little different with this episode. Chris is our first guest who is not an executive at a public company. But since this podcast is called Compounders, The Anatomy of a Multibagger, we thought it would be great to have the guy who literally wrote the book on finding 100 baggers. In this wide-ranging interview, Chris and I discussed the common attributes of 100 baggers Chris found in his study of compounders, the behavioral biases that make it hard for investors to realize a 100 bagger, why individual investors might be more likely than our institutional investors to get the full benefit of decades of compounding, where serial acquirers fit within the 100 bagger paradigm, and why high incremental returns on capital are so important to long-term success. And without any further ado, here's my conversation with Chris Mayer. So Chris, I know there's not a simple formula as it relates to stocks that eventually go up 100x, but for those people who have not read your book, can you talk about any common attributes of 100 baggers in the study that you ran through 2014? Sure. Um, I would say the one key factor they had in common would be they... um, earned high returns on capital, had the ability to reinvest and earn those high returns again and again and again for a very long period of time. So then it just becomes a math problem, right? I mean, if you can compound it 20% for 25 years, you got a hundred back. There were other things too that I pointed out, but but everything, there's always exceptions, right? So I'll say uh, almost all of them had extraordinary growth. You know, you looked at the, the end and they were a lot bigger businesses than they were at the beginning. Although even then, there are some exceptions where companies had bought back tremendous amounts of stock. So maybe the actual businesses didn't grow as much as you would expect it. But in general, a lot of growth. Um, another one that I liked in general is that you know, a lot of them had some entrepreneur behind it, especially in the beginning. And so, like I tell people in the book, uh, you know, if I were to mention Apple, you think of, you know, Steve Jobs. If I say Walmart, you say Sam Walton. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of ones. Uh, 100 baggers that were like that, where there was a single driving force that really got it going. So those are those are some big ones. You know, the other thing is to get 100 bagger. Most of these, you know, there's a survival factor involved. So um, you know, the, the pretty good balance sheets. You know, you didn't you weren't dealing with companies that were hyper leveraged. These are companies that had to survive multiple cycles. Um, so those are some things. And then you know, size. Obviously, a lot of them started small. I think, but they were they were bigger than you would expect. Now, one thing I did in my study is I screened out a lot of the stocks that were, I screened out a lot of micro caps and um, things like uh, you know junior mining stocks, and because I wanted to get at a population that might have some predictable characteristics. And so the median size, if I remember correctly, was something like three hundred something million in revenues. So you're talking, you know, pretty decent sized businesses. You know, it's, it's interesting and, and it shouldn't be surprising that there's no one formula for success. Or right. a, copy. a lot of ways to go up the mountain. So I'm interested. I mean, have you have you updated the study or um, done anything differently? Because if you think about the last seven years in public markets and thus in U.S. public markets has been pretty yeah. spectacular. Any 
anything that you would add to, you know, if you were redoing this, the study through 2021, that, that might be different or, um, you know, kind of incremental for, for people who are interested? No, I think, I think probably there would be, there would probably be more hundred baggers than, than they're in a study. Now there were a bunch of them that were close that probably would make the threshold. So the population would be a little different. The list in the back would be a little different. Um, I don't think so. I think, um, you know, when I look back on the book, if I could do something different or add something, I would have, I mentioned this in the book that I had hoped somebody else would come along and do, you know, hundred bagger studies for different markets, but I might've liked it myself. I'd gone back and maybe see if I could, you know, do a list for Canada or the UK, or at least try to pull out a couple international markets and add chapters on just to see. Um, but that's about the only thing I think. In, in your original response to, you know, kind of the common attributes, one of the things that you highlighted, and I think this was really interesting to me, was, you know, it wasn't that you just had a high historical return on equity or, or so return on capital, but also the, the incremental ones. Maybe, maybe talk, a, I mean, you said it's a math problem, but maybe just talk a little bit about that. Like, why, why is that so important? And then as an investor, how do you, how do you think about going about, you know, Pro, looking at returns prospectively as opposed to re- retrospectively. Yeah, I think that's where the incremental turn or turn comes in because sometimes you you know it's really nice to find a business that let's say it's earning fifteen percent return on capital, but incremental return is twenty or twenty five because then you know that directionally it's it's actually going to get better, it's going to improve. Um, so you get quite a boost if you can peek around the corner a little bit if you can find something that is pretty good today but it's, you know moving to great over the next three, four, five years. And there, there have been some businesses like that where you look at it and their return on capital actually you know, increases. Their margins go up. They get better, better with age. And those are wonderful. You can find those. But you know, that takes a little digging. So you, maybe you start initially with businesses that have decent returns, and then you try to dig and, and look at the incremental returns and, and see if you can find something where in the numbers where the future may look a little better. And it's, it's funny, one of the things that you didn't specifically highlight as one of the characteristics was an initial valuation that was cheap, right? Like, you know, we're value investors and, and, and right. I think, you know, we look at cheap multiples as thinking as, as like, you know, that's your starting point, then multiple expansion on top of that looks great. So, you know, but why, why do you think that wasn't, a, you know, an obvious characteristic that you were starting with that? X multiple of revenues or, or EBITDA or EBS. And then, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, way part, higher. I think a good part of that is that the power of compounding is hard for our minds to get to wrap around. You know, it's hard to wrap your head around a business that's going to go and compound its capital for 20% a year for 10 years. And I did this just recently with one of our holdings, Copart. And I remember when I first discovered Copart, it was 2011. I did this in 20, one of my 2021 letters. And uh, I remember passing on it because at the time I thought it was expensive. It was a 20 something times earnings. And I was like, eh, you know, hand and hot. And of course, the stock from that point was a 10 bagger over the next decade. So, you know, how do you figure? So if you back the way you did, you could back into it. You could pay, it could have paid like, I forget the exact number. It was like 67 times earnings I could have paid in 2011 and still made 15% compounded over that 10 year because it had a four bagger over that 10 year period. So it just goes to show you, you know, multiple analysis. The problem with it is a lot of times it truncates your view. You know, you're looking at a cheap multiple and you're looking at the next year, two or three. And it's harder to like think out 10 years, you know, what, what's going to happen if it compounds over uh, you know, that time. And the thing about Copart is that uh, even back then, if you had looked at its returns, you'd made some assumptions about its ability to reinvest and you'd cast that out 10 years, you would have, you would have seen that this was, a, uh, you know, could have been a machine. And what actually happened is that it wound up doing quite a bit better. You know, this is one of the ones we talked about before where the incremental return was higher and it's actually got better over time due to scale and as it increased the density of its network and so forth. So, um, yeah, you, you can wind up paying quite a bit more. Now, of course, you got to get it right. You know, you, that's why, you know, one of the things that came out of the book for me is I would be used to be one of those guys who was always, you know, valuation first. That's, that's what got me interested. But now I think I spend a lot more time making sure that I have the business right. That, uh, you know, is this a business that has defensible competitive position? 
and it can really compound capital for a decade at, at a high rate. If I can't get there, then I'm not interested. I don't care what the valuation is. Um, then if that makes sense. Then I know it's, you know, then I start working back and thinking, well, what can I pay, you know, and earn a certain whatever term, return I want to underwrite it. And you mentioned, you know, kind of like limited limited ability for us to get our minds around compounding. And obviously there are biases associated with all kinds of anything you're doing and when you're making decisions under uncertainty. Right. So I'm interested, you know, what psychological biases do you think limit people's ability to own stocks that eventually turn into a hundred baggers? Well, I think the first one that comes to mind would be a lack of patience. Uh, it's incredibly hard. I mean, it's easy to say, um, but you know we're in markets every day. We see stocks moving. We think we see things that are hot, and it's hold, hard to hold on to something that's not going anywhere for for years. And so, in the study, you know there there are long stretches of time where hundred baggers would go nowhere. You know, right in the midst of their run, you would have two, three, five year stretches of time where they went nowhere. You know, from point to point. You know, they could up and down, but uh, and so th- those periods are extremely trying. Uh, everyone talks about the drawdowns. The drawdowns definitely, I think. That's true as well. It's hard to hold during, you know, a lot of these things drop the third, 50% or more. And that's pretty brutal. I mean, I would say like Berkshire Hathaway was the best performing stock in the study, right? And even that stock was cut in half at least three times. And there was one seven year stretch where it went nowhere. And that was the best, you know. So you can imagine, you know, lots of stocks that are very, very good <laughs> have bigger drawdowns and longer stretches where they don't go anywhere. So, yeah, the patience part is the biggest, I'd say the biggest hurdle for people with uh, inability to have a hundred bagger. Compounders is brought to you in partnership with Tegas. We created Compounders to uncover the lessons and frameworks of the best capital compounders in the world. And if you are a professional investor, VC, or operator, and you appreciate the deep research into the businesses explored on this podcast, check out tegas.co slash compounders. With Tegas, you can learn about any company directly from former execs, current customers, and industry experts, all of which are in position to offer unique insights into company's growth, its customer value, and its competition. What makes Tegas different is that you don't have to lead your own expert calls. The platform offers instant access to the world's largest collection of investor-led call transcripts on companies such as Compounders Guests, Viasat, Element Solutions, and Avid Technology. All you have to do is log in and you'll get instant access to nearly 25,000 expert call transcripts. And the best part, the Tegas collection grows larger with each investor and company that joins. Still want to do your own expert calls? Tegas is the right solution. Experts that are just as good or better than what you'd find on other networks, but starting at just $300 per call, not the $1,000 or more others charge. If you're ready to go deeper on the next compounding business, head to tegas.co slash compounders for a free trial. I can personally say that having access to the Tegas platform and Rolodex of experts has fundamentally changed the quality of due diligence Coast Street does on both new and existing ideas. I'll also throw out there the anchoring, right? So you, this, you anchor to your original cost basis. Oh, yeah. It's gone up. You know, well, that ties to that ties to patience, right? Because that makes you impatient. You see that you see these blinking prices, you know, every day. I, I always have a great story about that, where a friend of mine had a, a, a you know painting, it was fine art painting that he bought, and I don't know, he paid some outrageous amount of money for it at the time, but he just hung it up and he just kind of left it there. It was like the showpiece in his house, right? And then. You know, because he doesn't have prices blinking in front of him every day, he just held it for like twenty years or something like that, and uh, and then he found out it was worth you know two million dollars or more or whatever it was. Um, but the idea is, to your point, is if he got a quote, somebody knocked on his door offering some amount of money for it every day. No way he holds that thing for twenty years. No way he holds it. You know, he probably sells it after it makes three times his money or something, or maybe it goes up 10 times and then gets cut in half. And then he decides he wants to get rid of it. You know, it's just, it's very, very hard psychologically uh, to do this if you are too focused on those prices. And, and the funny thing, and I thought about this as I was reading your book 
is that, you know, you're, to, to some extent, you're talking about the coffee can portfolio, right? Like that painting, the analogy in, in, in stocks is that you just pick 10 stocks and you put them in a coffee can and you, you know, you don't look at them. Yeah. You know, it, so in, in a weird way, I mean, would you argue that it's almost harder for an, a, a professional investor who's doing this every day? to realize a hundred bagger relative to someone who's, you know, a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, an accountant or something like that. And just, you know, makes it, makes one copy can decision and it looks in, you know, five or, you know, five or 10 years later, you think that's a fair assessment? I think so. I think that's definitely the case. Uh, much more difficult for a professional because professionals being graded and uh, judged with every monthly and quarterly numbers that come out. Uh, and so it becomes very, very difficult to hold on to something that doesn't go anywhere for a while or worse goes down where, you know, individuals, I mean, I started the book with a lot of anecdotes from people who had hundred baggers and you'll note there always, a lot of them are versions of, you know, Oh, my grandfather held a stock and you know, well, we, we got it. And it was worth, you know, this amount. And I, I got a lot of stories like that. Uh, only I totally took some, you know, to the book in the book, just to make that point, just to highlight that point. But I suspect that, uh, you know, if you just sort of cast out, you know, what the population of people actually realize hundred baggers is, I, I bet that most of them are just individuals that just bought stock and almost, you know, almost forgot about it or ju just held it for a very long time, either because they, maybe they worked there or whatever, but um, there aren't very many. I think it's very difficult for most pros. It's funny. That's it. If you're ever, if there ever was an indictment of our business, that would be it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, my guess is that, that, you know, you, you might have some insights into some of the common traits that do allow a professional investor to hold onto something, sure. even though these stocks often have large drawdowns in the interim long enough to, to achieve those returns. What do, you, what do you think, you know, obviously patience, what other kind of traits do you think are, are necessary, yeah. probably, but not sufficient? Yeah, I've <laughs> to, talked to a bunch of them. Kind of uh, I've talked to several pros who've had hundred bags and, and more than one. Um, so I would say, I was thinking about this recently. <clears throat> I think, well, one, one I talked to just this week and he was telling me, uh, you know, I think they have the ability to just tune out the stuff that otherwise most people pay so much attention to, like what the economy is doing and what the Fed is doing and the kind of the more immediate worries that are in the headlines and the people who, the professionals who are able to nab those gains are people I think are just willing, able to tune that out and it doesn't phase them. They just hold on and they have this tenacity of, uh, of sticking with a business as long as it's doing whatever. I mean, a lot of times there's certain KPIs they're focusing on and as long as those things are coming along, you know, they leave it alone and they buy more. That kind of gets back to the original uh, Thomas Phelps 100 to 1 in the stock market, which my book was kind of an update and is certainly inspired by what Phelps did. And I remember one of the charts he had in his book were very, is very striking. He had this chart of Pfizer, a table, and it has, I think maybe it was over a 20 year period and it has just some basic financials. So it had like sales, earnings per share, ROE, you know, very basic. And he asks you, look at that chart and he goes, is there any point in this on this table where you would have sold Pfizer? I mean, you look at it every year, it's cranking out you know, the ROE is whatever it was, 20 plus, you know, it's doing well. But the stock, of course, was up and down and, you know, crazy volatility. But over that period of time, it was a hundred bagger. And so his point is, if you just stay laser focused on those fundamentals, you would never have touched it and you would have had your hundred bagger. So I think uh, that meshes with what, when I've talked to some of these investors, professionals who have had them, and I'm talking about professionals who've had them by buying and owning something for a long time. I'm not talking about people who've traded something or done something with options or bought something, you know, stub security. It was whatever. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about buying and holding an equity for a period of a couple of decades. And they also had this ability to just focus on those, some key fundamentals and tune out everything else. And the other thing we have to worry about in the, you know, the asset management business is that, is about position weighting, right? So if you're if you have institutional investors and all of a sudden a, a position's gotten to twenty percent of the portfolio or more, 
you know, it's probably true that, uh, you know, people start start getting really nervous. You're going to answer all these questions about it. But an individual yeah. investor doesn't have that problem per se. And it, it allows for more longevity potentially. Well, and asset flows as well, right? A professional has to worry when times are tough. Invariably, you get redemptions. And it happens even to the best investors. So it depends, you know, on your capital base. If you have a permanent capital base like a Warren Buffett, it's a tremendous, tremendous advantage. No, ag- agreed on that. And so, you know, as I was reading your book, I was trying to think, and I, I love, I, I don't know if you have any anecdotes about this as you as you were talking to people, but like, you know, obviously a stock that goes up a hundred times, regardless of where it started, becomes a much larger percentage of your portfolio. Do you have yeah. a sense of how people people in the professional business navigated that specific issue yeah. of, of the position sizing? Well, as you might guess, what winds up happening is they just constantly chopping that position back. Uh, I forget the money manager. It was a guy, T. Rowe, who had Walmart in a small cap fund when Walmart was a, was a small cap. <laughs> and, you know, stock performed so well. I mean, it was constantly butting up against his limits for position size. So he's just constantly selling a little bit of it, selling a little bit of it, selling a little bit. And it's kind of funny to look back, you know, I... If he had been able to just hold on that position, it would have been bigger than the rest of his fund. I mean, at some point down the line. So that's what we want. That's what he winds up happening is wind up just continually chopping down that position, which I guess you would say is a pretty high class problem. I mean, uh, you know, you're, you're doing okay if you got one of those and you're just riding it and constantly, constantly cutting. You point out another institutional constraint associated with being a professional money manager, especially if you run, you know, quote unquote, small cap. Right. If you have, if you're right, um, and something goes from, you know, five hundred yeah. million to five billion, it's probably out of small cap. So that's a, that's a ten bagger, and it's out. There's no room for a hundred bagger in that's right. you know, a traditional small cap portfolio. Absolutely right. I mean, professionals have these arbitrary designations, which an individual doesn't care if it's small cap becomes a mid cap becomes a large cap, and uh, individual can also uh, also withstand that position becoming much larger. So. You know, I know on my fund, I have a limit of 25% for any one position. It's pretty high. Yeah. Uh, but if you were an individual, I mean, you could, <laughs> you know, just let something really run. Uh, so, yeah, it's another possible constraint. And um, you have a section in your book about competition and mean reversion. And, you know, one of the comments that you made um you know, I think you, you do have a comment and, and, and we can talk about this, about gro- the kind of stability of gross margins. But I also want to talk about like, you know, you highlight Monster as an example of a stock that's just been, a, just, well, for lack of a better word, a monster. Monster. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's been an incredible stock. But I see that, you know, you go to the grocery store, talk about the most competitive industry you could possibly imagine. How many energy drinks are there? So I'm no. interested, like how, if you have any sense of like how a company like that has been able to um, you know, avoid that competition and the mean reversion that t- tr- traditionally comes into, especially competitive industries. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a great point because some of these, you know, I probably would not have gotten involved in just because competition is so heavy. I mean, it's not just monster, but you could think about any of the hundred baggers that were in retail or, I mean, they're just a sea of competitors. So you really have to drill down. I suppose monster, you know, there is some kind of brand loyalty perhaps, um, and when it comes to beverages, distribution becomes a big deal. So, uh, you know, Monster did make a deal with Coke, although I believe that was fairly late. I could be wrong. I don't know Monster's history all that well, but, um, uh, that gave them, you know, access to a lot of markets and, and perhaps smaller startups and other beverage, uh, these energy drinks didn't. So now they're all backed by, you know, these giant companies, but in early going, perhaps they weren't. So, I don't really have a great answer for Monster specifically, but um, you know, you did hint at something there that I thought was interesting when I did the study, which is this this idea that uh, you know high and high gross margins can be kind of an indicator, right? Because they tend to be sticky. Um, so anyway, that I think that's a I mean, Monster had really good gross margins. Yeah, I mean, it's something that, you know, capitalism and w- would suggest to you that 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 returns would get eaten away. And so yeah. you know, it's it's an interesting point. And, and look, it must be you would assume that it is to to be that successful. Right. You have to be in an industry where the margins are 
somewhat sticky on the growth side. And, and, and what you're looking at is survivorship bias because of all mm. the other industries <laughs> that didn't have the, those gross margins don't see hundred bankers. That's probably a logical conclusion. Yeah, that's probably, that's probably a good part of it. But sometimes with these companies, you, you really got to, you really got to dig in um, and to discover sometimes competitive advantages can be, I don't know, maybe surprising in like an industry you wouldn't expect to. So for example, I always like to point to old dominion freight lines, you know, if you look at it at first, you're going to think, well, it's a trucker. It's like so many com- competitors. How can a trucking company have any kind of competitive advantage? And that you look at Old Dominion, it consistently generates you know, high returns on invested capital, like much higher than any of its competition. And when you start to dig into it, you find that, you know, oh, well, Old Dominion has service centers and they've made this the strategic decision to invest in real estate and build these service centers. Other com- competitors have leased it. Other com- competitors haven't in- invested as aggressively in this network. And so it's like taking all this time. But now after, you know, two decades of doing this, they have this s- almost impossible to replicate, you know, physical distribution center that every time they add, it just increases the density and efficiency of the network. And so their operating ratio, which is kind of an efficiency ratio in that industry is, you know, miles better than their competition and still going lower and lower and lower. In fact, that just the last quarter, they had a record low on the operating ratio for the company. So, you know, the, sometimes you'll see markers of competitive advantage. Like I say, if you see something with a high, consistently high return on invested capital or return, any kind of return on capital measure, but it otherwise doesn't seem like a business that should have an advantage. Those, those can be interesting because if you really dig in, there's got to be something. There's some reason, right? Because otherwise, like you said, forces of capitalism would say that eventually you're going to eat away at those high returns. And so if that hasn't happened, you know, why? It's really those kind of situations intrigue me and make me want to dig in, dig in more and find out why it, why it is. I think that speaks to, you know, obviously there are some plenty of quantitative measures of, of a good business, but I think that gets to strategy and management being the key. It's like, why does why do all the other home builders almost go bankrupt in a crisis? Exactly. Like why is NVR so successful? NVR doesn't, right? Because it gets to, to management. Anything, anything you glean, I know this wasn't like you necessarily your focus in the book, but anything you gleaned about management traits, um, or that you, either through your career or through writing the book that that you think you know are helpful for for, for to people looking for a hundred baggers. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, capital allocation part is important because you can have management teams can destroy value by doing well classically by doing poor acquisitions right or um doing buybacks at, at you know just top of the market kind of things or using debt to do buybacks so there's there's certainly mistakes in capital allocation side that can be that can be quite you know harmful for their long-term returns i think there's that famous quote from buffett where he says you know a management team that responsible for investing 10 percent of the capital and you know how you know the rest of it is that over the next 10 years is responsible for 60% of the capital in the business or something like that. The, the point being that it has a tremendous impact over time, this capital allocation. So uh, yeah, I would say you want some you want to look at that capital allocation over time. You want to see what kinds of things they do. Some some management teams are, I mean, ideally you find a business where it's where it's obvious, right? You're just building more restaurants or building more stores. And so it's just kind of automatic and there's the intrinsic economic value in doing that and they don't have to worry about it but some businesses generate lots of free cash and what do they do with it you know so capital allocation somehow evaluating the capital allocation skills of the management team i, I think that can be important and that, and that can make a big difference with uh you know some of these companies were able to generate very good returns by just being cannibals just buying back so much of their own stock and you brought up acquisitions in that. And, and when and as I was reading your book, I was wondering, you know, there are certainly serial acquirers and roll-ups that have become great successes. I mean, I think of something yeah. like Constellation or right. an XPO, what, what they did, you know, that's been an incredible stock. Um, if you look at the, the spin, yeah, after the spin of GXO, I mean, that's been a, you know, mm. th- that, those were roll-ups. And so what, it, what role do you think those played in the hundred bagger paradigm. And, and, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on like, is that just, 
is that a harder way to go about life given what we know about M&A usually accruing to the, the value of the M&A accruing to the seller rel- relative to the buyer? Yeah, I mean, there, that, might be, that might be the thing you asked me earlier, what might I do if I you know, did the book again? Maybe that would be it. I'd have a chapter separately on serial acquirers or, or maybe get into that M&A discussion more because that's one thing that I've come to learn more about and appreciate more since I did the book is that there are some companies that have this skill at doing it. You could say like a Danaher, you could include Roper, um, U.S. companies, but then there are, you know, there's several overseas that are famous for it too. In the U.K., I think companies like Hama or in Sweden, you know, the Swedish serial acquirers like Lifco and AdTech uh, have done phenomenally well over long periods of time. So I think uh, the acquisition question requires a little nuance. So if it's small acquisitions that are kind of routine, um, that can be a competency. And I think that's, to me, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I don't discount that or say that's a harder way to go than organic. I mean, there's certain advantages too, if you are doing lots of small little acquisitions all the time, um, you have more time, you know, you have some control of the timing of how you invest, um, so I, I like those. If you're doing you know, large acquisitions, if you're using leverage, if you're, those are kinds of warning signs. Um, and you can look at a management team past history acquisitions. You know, do, have they worked? Have they improved the business? Have they lead to write downs you know, years later? So some companies are very good. Heiko is another company, the exceptional uh, acquirer, and they have certain ways they do it. So then, so Heiko well, you know, they don't often buy 100% of the company, they'll buy 80% and then the management team stays for another 20, 20%. And, and so they are managed to keep people, you know, skin in the game. Other companies use earnouts where they'll have, you know, to try to keep the incentive base in there. So, um, yeah, I think the acquisition question requires a little more nuance and thought, but I'm, I'm perfectly fine with the serial acquirers like Constellation, Dan Hare, Heiko, the ones we're mentioning where they have a consistent track record of success and deploying capital. Um, through the small acquisitions and doing it again and again and again. You know what I would love to see, and I bet, you know, this is just a hypothesis, but my guess is there, the number of companies that were hundred baggers that did a, you know, transformational deal, right? Like that yeah. big deal. I bet it's much more like a, you know, a Roper or a Danaher or, you know, just like that constellation, just consistent small deals as opposed to that one, you uh, know, this one's going to be the whiz bang change to this company. Right. My guess is that, especially if you're issuing equity, that that could have that. I, I bet that list is very short of companies that were successful doing it that way. I would I would agree. I would agree. Um. So, let's see where do I want to go. Um. So it, one of the hardest parts, especially for value investors, is that when a company hasn't generated operating profits or a lot of cash in its history, it's really hard for us to get excited. And so. I'm, you know, I think Amazon's always like the perfect example. Yeah. Of, yeah. Look, they were investing all this free cash flow, you know, and they were there investing all their cash flow and, and they weren't making cash, but there was a solid business underneath it. And that you, you, you know, you, know, you should have seen it. Well, I mean, it was obviously in real time, not so easy for people to see. And, and obviously and some people did, but maybe could you talk about other methods of assessing profitability and valuation that we should, that, that you would consider in such cases? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say it's nothing, nothing, nope problem or shame in being traditional about it and just insisting you want companies to generate you know cash and return on capital yeah you're going to miss some you're going to miss some of these you know that were unprofitable for years and and then suddenly became profitable and great business so amazon yeah is kind of the classic case but there i'm sure there are lots of others that have um tech related businesses that haven't made money for quite a while but, but still wound up being great investments because uh there was a solid business business underneath, and eventually they did generate free cash. But you know, part of the reason we have investment filters is to make the investment universe manageable. And so, you know, you're going to miss miss things. So for me, I don't really consider. I'm not very creative about you know trying to look at unit economics and you know just convince myself I can buy a business that's losing money because unit economics are good. I, I want to buy the business as a whole today and it's working, you know, and, and I want it to have some prospect even that it gets better. But, you know, that's for me. Other people could be more adventurous in what models they use to try to detect some of these things early. And do you think as an investor, you know, 
looking around the corner, exactly what you're saying is like, not what this is, but what it could be. I mean, is that a, is it almost like a, you know, there's just, I think I would agree with you that value investors are traditionally not great at that. I personally am not, you know, I'd rather like invest on something that's fairly valued to undervalued today and everything else is gravy and upside from there. Do you think to be able to hold a hundred bagger or to achieve a hundred bagger, you, you have to be almost like you, you, yeah, you're more of like a, and for lack of a better word, like a kind of a visionary in terms of the, like the way you look at the company. I don't think so. I mean, I think, uh, uh, well, first I'll respond to your point about, uh, you know, if you're going into something, you only want to buy it when it's fairly valued or less, you know, the, the challenge with that then is when you look at the path of these multi, and it doesn't even have to be hundred baggers, just multi baggers. There's always stretches of time where they're overvalued. And so if you're going in on that premise, it makes it really hard to hold when that's no longer true. Right. So if you're valuation centric at the get go, uh, I don't think there's much chance for you to hold on to something that'll become a multi bagger unless just by accident it happens to continue to grow and you think continue to think it's undervalued the whole time, which is not usually how it goes. Usually, they overshoot, you know, and they go through long stretches where the stock's just expensive. How many times have we looked at stocks? And said, yeah, that's a great business, but it's too expensive, right? And that can happen for years. It could be like that. So, you know, that makes it tough if you're coming in with valuation. Uh, centric part part, um, and there was a second part of your question which I've lost. I lost my track on chain of thought on. Um, no, I mean I think I think that's a good that's a good answer. Okay, right? it, makes, okay. it makes a lot of sense. In in the, which you know it brings up the idea, and I think you had an interesting section in your book about boredom that I thought was pretty oh, yeah. profound. <laughs> you know, I think most people would get really bored owning the same stock for ten years. I mean. Do you have any processes or for lack of the better word, like investing hacks to, to counteract that boredom? Because everybody knows there's just like the newness of the new stock and the opportunity and the potential is kind of sexy. Yeah. But, but I mean, that's, but clearly you can make a lot of money holding the same stocks. Well, I think, you know, part of it is I tell people write stuff down and I think that helps me too. Like, so you write a little investment memo to yourself while you're owning something, you take a 10 year look and, and you have certain milestones and certain, you know, key performance indicators you're going to watch. And as long as the stock continues to meet those hurdles, then you just have to, you know, you stick with it. Um, so, you know, the other point I was thinking of your first question, you said, you do have to be a visionary. And I don't necessarily think this tales being a visionary per se, because as all it entails is in some of these businesses, maybe a little imagination. So if you, let's just say, hypothetically, you were investing in McDonald's had 300 you know, franchise stores in the U.S., you, it doesn't take that much to imagine that it might be able to expand and grow or if you had a Home Depot or, uh, so I think about that kind of thing. You, you know, we, we, have, we do a pretty good job. You can assess kind of what total market looks like and what might be the potential. So as much as possible, you have to focus on that and uh, write it down so you can't convince yourself later of something else. You know, that's, I do think keep an investing journal. Uh, I think that helps helps a lot kind of follow your own thinking and what you were thinking initially and uh, because you can persuade yourself to you know believe almost anything and i, I want to i do have a question about that and, and the value of writing the book but i do want to stay on one of the things you mentioned i mean you, we've talked about a lot of retail successes you know you've mentioned home depot we've mentioned mcdonald's and walmart and all yeah. of a lot of retail success within that hundred baggers list. And I'm just wondering when I was reading your book, I was saying to myself, I bet a lot of that is, has played out. Like what are the chances that if you were starting <laughs> today that, you know, given the retail penetration and what it's gotten to in the U S and right. obviously, you know, econ, maybe, maybe, maybe it, it changes to more of a, you know, you were a retailer and now you're e e more econ, but I wonder yeah. if, you, if you would, if you would agree or think that that's going to be much harder mm -hmm. I agree. For, for, and I would agree maybe possible. for a different reason is that uh, the market investors are so heightened to look for it. So when something does come along, it's remarkable. Like let's say a wing stop, great business, but the valuation is, you know, uh, I haven't looked at it recently. Maybe now it's come down, but it was super, you know, super high. So that's what happens is then you do, when you do have something uh, uh, that has remarkable, you know, economics and it's that small growing store base. People get very, very excited. There was another one. Uh, I can't think of it a little, the burger joint, uh, that was just same thing. I mean, the valuation just went nuts. So that's why I think it's gonna be a lot harder because you're going to be paying, you know, a huge premium to own those kinds of names now. And maybe they do work, uh, over a very long time horizon, but it certainly makes it tougher.
And I've forgotten if you mentioned this in, in the book, but was there any, I mean, I, th- I think it was, there wasn't any industry specific, right? It wasn't yeah. like heavily weighted. I mean, there was a fair number of retail names, but it wasn't like, you know, there was this high skew towards consumer companies or industrial or something like that. It was pretty widespread. Is that a fair assessment of, of yeah, the Yeah, that was one of the things that surprised me a little bit because I expected the list to be dominated by tech names. Um, but it really wasn't. There was you know, railroads, there was utility stocks. Of course, utility stocks took a long time <laughs> to get there, you know, 50 years or whatever. But still, uh, it was a it was a varied list. There really wasn't any industry that you know I could look at and say, yeah, you should fish here. It was, they were all over the place. So that's why people tell ask me, like to ask, well, there's certain industries we should focus on. And I always say, hey, you know really probably better to just be industry ag- agnostic and just focus on the economics and the return on capital and reinvestment rate and those basic nuts and bolts of what makes a hundred bagger rather than worry too much about industry affiliation. Although you might safely cut out something like public utilities because, you know, it's going to be a very long wait for one of those. You know, another thing that, that just sparked in my mind is, as you start talking about that is I wonder if you know, I know you said there's probably been more hundred baggers, obviously, since since the study. But I wonder if, given the nature of private equity and venture capital, how long, much longer companies are staying private. I wonder if there's not going to be a whole lot of you know McDonald's as a small cap because they're going to come out with a valuation that just makes it a lot harder to go to hundred x and and a lot of those. A lot of the, the the hundred bagging has already been captured by the VCs and PE firms. What do you, what do you think of that idea? Uh, I think that's pro- that's probably true. And what my first reaction to that was: this is you know this is why you have to start kicking around outside the U.S. Because uh, yeah, I mean I totally agree. And in, in in the U.S., that would be it, I totally agree with everything you just said, and that's probably true. But if you go to you know some parts in Europe, then uh, you probably have a better chance of perhaps finding a small retail concept like that, that, you know, in its earlier stages. So, uh, but yeah, I think that's probably true. I mean, you know, markets change and investors are always kind of looking for the looking back and looking at what was the most successful thing. And they're very, you know, attuned to finding that again. So, you know, for a while, I think that's probably going to be pretty tough to find the next McDonald's that hasn't already, like you said, come out at a huge valuation. You know what I wonder, and I don't know if you have any anecdotes or, or, or thoughts on this is, you know, let's, let's say we like the strategy that I've run has 23 stocks, right? So pretty concentrated. And, you know, like I, I looked through our, our portfolio and I think we have sort of a lot of interesting companies, but I don't think, you know, without the benefit of what took 10 years of, of hindsight, I don't think I could, uh, you know, I, I, or I don't think I could identify which one was going to be a hundred bagger. I wonder if a lot of these investors, you know, this was just one compelling stock within a portfolio mm-hmm. versus no, I, this, this was an, you know, quote unquote obvious from, you know, you know, at McDonald's and as well, right. Walmart as a small cup. I wonder, do you have any thoughts on that idea? I think that's probably fair. I mean, it, it's pretty bold to own a stock today and say, yeah, I think this is going to be, you know, a hundred bagger. I mean, it's a long, long road, but Again, if you focus on those kind of nuts and bolts pieces of it, um, you know, uh, like I said in the beginning, it's a math problem, right? If you compound your capital at X percent for X number of years, you get you get a certain result. So as long as you just kind of continue to focus on buying companies that have those high returns, that be able to reinvest, that seem to have good, really, really strong competitive positions, seem like they'll be able to do it for at least the next decade. I mean, that's all you have to do, and then you just, you know, you just keep kind of monitoring it and, and, and ride it for as long as all those things are true. And uh, the result should be pretty surprising. I mean, even, I even emphasize in the book, you know, don't necessarily get too fixated on, you know, 100x per se, because we'll all be happy if you get 50x or 10x, most people be delighted, right? So you want to really just focus on like the components, the engine, like you say, that, that gets you there. And, uh, and then the destination takes care of itself. And you mentioned um, the importance of writing things down and how I think as an investor, like uh, you know, writing down my thoughts has, has become hugely important, especially to clarify my own thinking. How, how have you changed, if at all, as an investor, as a result of, you know, 
starting this process of writing the book or and yeah. doing the research and then writing it and then the evolution of has that it were you always kind of a you know kind of like a good quality high return on capital guy or is this have you evolved kind of as yeah. a result of what what's happened here no i definitely well i would say i was much more eclectic about it so i i'd have a portfolio that i portfolios i ran for years and years would have you know a couple special situations might be like deep value here you know you'd be, you have it carved up. I'd be interested in different things. Uh, I think what the book, working on the book has made me think, wow, you know, I, I want to make my whole focus this thing. I want this to be it. I want to own these. I want to find these great businesses that I can just sit on and leave alone. Um, so that's, I think, the biggest change is that it's kind of focused my attention on that. And I'm not interested in, in anymore in these kinds of things that I used to be interested, like some of the parts and, you know, this is going to spin out here or these different things that would happen, uh, which, you know, I did okay with, but it's very transaction heavy and, you know, it's a lot more work. I think this is, this is a nicer way to do it if you can do it. And, and not everyone, you know, necessarily has the temperament for it, you, you know, got to be patient and it also refocuses your work a little. Cause then, like I mentioned earlier, I spent a lot of time on the business and understanding the competitive position and the, and the economics of it and the likelihood that it will persist. And those things come to dominate my, my attention. Uh, so I, I'd say, yeah, the book changed me quite a bit. And would, would you say that the hurdle rate for a stock getting into the portfolio as a result of like, you know, this work is kind of like a benchmark for, for, for how successful you want to be. Would you, would you say it's much, not, you know, relative to maybe 10 years ago, it's much harder for something to get into the portfolio. Uh, yeah. That's, that's a, that's a really, that's a good way to say it is that the, the hurdle rate to get in the portfolio is much, much, much higher, much higher. So yeah, that's definitely true. And do you run more concentrated as, as a result of that or, or similar concentration? I run more concentrated, uh, more concentrated now than before. Um, right now I'm down to like 10. So I think that's kind of 10 to 12 is kind of the number I like. Uh, I used to run more like, uh, like 16 to 25 kind of range. Uh, but, you know, it gets harder and harder to find these. And if your hurdle is really, really high, it's harder and harder to find them. And when you find them. Uh, you really want to you want to put some real money behind it. So uh, for me, it's been the natural evolution, but I don't think that's the way it has to be. Um, I, I think you could do it with 25 names and have the same kind of focus. Um, so that's it's more a matter of, I think, taste, preference, and what kind of resources you have. And as you've evolved as an investor, right? Like it sounds like valuation and especially like NAVs or some of the parts, just things that were optically cheap or really attractive to you. How, um, you know, how, what, what have you, have you had to, I mean, how has your mindset changed? And then how have you, is there any other like things that you've done, you know, more quote unquote investing hacks that, that you've used to get yourself focused away from optical, optical cheapness well, and, and I'd just say that one, allure of cheapness? Yeah. I think one thing that was a defining moment for me was the 08 crisis. Mm. And I remember during that time, you could buy stuff super cheap. I mean, very low multiples earnings, net cash. And uh, I did a lot of that, buying just stuff that was super optically cheap. And yeah, I mean, that stuff worked. Then you sell it. And then what? You know, you pay your taxes. And now you find you've got money and the market's a lot higher. And I look back, I think, wow, I, you know, I could have bought if I had just bought, you know, better companies and just held them. I would have been much better off. I, I would I'd probably still own some of those names today and they'd be, you know, a lot higher. So that, well, I remember I vowed that next time something like that happened, that I would go to the top of the list. I'd go to my favorite businesses and I would buy those rather than go for what was optimally cheap. And so- and then I did have that opportunity with the pandemic. Uh, so that's when I bought Heiko and Copart. It was in March of 2020, two businesses that I long admired. They were always looked expensive. And I was finally able to buy those, buy them then. So, I, so I, I've done it. I still own both of them. They're still good-sized positions. And I probably own them for years and years. So that's, that was a defining moment for me, just the experience of, having, of going through that. I mean, optically cheap. You know, I don't want to say 
I don't want to say like there's one path, you know, because I know lots of guys who are super successful just buying these kinds of things that are optically cheap, you know, more successful than me. So I don't want to say that this is the way you have to do it, but there are certain advantages that I think I like better the, the style where you can buy and hold because um, the optically cheap forces you have a lot of turnover and you got to keep finding new things. And sometimes there's, it's very, very hard to find anything. Uh, versus much more tax efficient to just hold on to something and, you know, make it ride, ride up as a six or seven X, 10 X over a decade. That's, that's the ideal. You know, you're, you're certainly preaching to the choir because your, your evolution kind of is, is very similar to mine over the last decade, you know, but one thing that I've been thinking a lot about is triage. Like, okay. So, you know, the page, the patients in the, in the hospital, right. It's March, 2020, or, you know, maybe it's for so, some investors, it's right now, right. Yeah. If you have a lot of technology stocks, obviously you're, you're, you're feeling some pain. So how have you thought about like triage and how did, for example, like Heiko and, and, um, and uh, sorry, what was the other one you mentioned? Heiko and Copart. And, and Copart. Yeah. Like, how did they, like, what about those like fl- made them t- float to the top of the list? And cause I just, I felt sometimes like, there's five things I could buy right now. Like, oh, how, yeah. do I, how do I think about triaging that? Right. Well, you know, I, I think it helps again have a very like uh, well-defined profile of what you want. So for me, there's some things for me that are always hard to find because one is I like to emphasize insider ownership, you know, skin in the game. And that eliminates a lot of things. Uh, and then great balance sheet. So then, you know, minimal leverage. So again, that'll eliminate a lot of things. And Gopar and Heiko both have, you know, strong insider ownership with Copards, Willis Johnson and Jay Dare together own, I don't know, just like 10% of it, the founder and the CEO. Uh, with Heiko, you know, the Mendelssohn family, they own whatever it is, 14%, I think it was at the time. Uh, so they had that, both of them, like pristine balance sheets, you know, no no debt, no net debt for sure. Uh, so they, that makes them float to the top. Plus they've just had this, you know, very solid track record, investing capital and doing the things we just talked about, earn high returns of capital, reinvested at high rates and seem to be able to do it again and again and again. So, you know, if you more, the more defined your kind of wish list ideal profile is, I think the easier it is to triage it. And you just take things that check the most boxes. Uh, even now I have some things I on my list that I, I like a lot, but they're too expensive and I just wait. You know what I really like about that answer is that the, the, the main, the two things you checked off were non-business related, mm. right? they were structure related, right? Or yeah. As opposed to like, this is, this is the industry structure. This is how the business runs. This is the margins. And I like that. Cause it's like, it's a, it's a filter that, that level sets all companies regardless mm-hmm. of the industry. Right. Um, and I want to ask one more question before we close or um, what? So one of the things that that I thought of as, as you're talking about Copart uh, and, and, and as an investor, whenever there's a similar business in the same industry, like yeah, a yeah. perfect comp, like IAA is a pretty decent comp, right? And, and maybe it's not quite as good, but, you know, there's this, there's this allure of being yeah. like, well, Copart trades here and I could buy IAA at half the multiple, get similar exposures. You know, yeah. how do you, and my guess is within the hundred baggers, there was plenty of situations in which you could have you know, you could have gone from Home Depot to Lowe's. You could have, you know, there's yeah. probably different Pepsi and you know, Coke or whatever the pairs you, you are. You could have made those moves. So it's, it's an interesting thought experiment, you know, because you do all this work on the industry and you see w- this big valuation discrepancy. Um, but it probably doesn't make sense. You know, it, it, in hindsight, it probably doesn't make sense to make the switch. Yeah. And I, I wrestled with this, you know, still even now when I come up with something. So yeah, with Copart, I was, I remember being tempted just by both. Um, but to me, you know, I looked at them and to me, Copar was, you know, clearly the better company, uh, you know, returns on capital were better. It was a better balance sheet, no leverage. I had some leverage. Um, so I went with, I went with the best, but, um, there are other times where I have that same issue. Um, you know, uh, like, let's say, I don't know, public insurance broker space, you know, all those companies have been successful. If you look at Aon and AJ Gallagher and, Brown and Brown, and you know they they've all done very well over a period of time. So you know the temptation is well just buy, you know two or three of them. But again, I kind of using my filters kind of sifted down to Brown and Brown being my favorite because it thirty five percent of it is inside you know held by the Brown family, other insiders and employees, 
again, is low leverage. And so it met a lot of these other boxes. And so I just went and bet with that. Um, but there is also that temptation you're talking about, which is that, you know, there's one leader, then there's something else that's cheaper. So even I mentioned Old Dominion Freight lines, that's a company that always trades at a significant premium to the rest of the com competition, like SIA, or if you were to buy one of the other truckers. But again, um, you know, the advantage Old Dominion is so clear when you really break it down, start to look at returns on capital, they are way higher at Old Dominion. So, and it's taking market share, you know, Old Dominion is taking market share at like a rate of 1% a year. Uh, so I, for me, my personal preference is to own the best one, even if I have to pay up a bit. Uh, I'm not going to go for the second one because it's a little bit cheaper. And I, I've seen a lot of situations where that doesn't work, but I've also seen some, like you mentioned, they, where they have worked out. You could have done fairly well owning Lowe's, I'm sure, um, when it was cheaper versus Home Depot. And I'm sure there's lots of other pairs we could come up with where the number two did did very well because the industry itself was you know, a good profit pool and good returns and good growth rate. So maybe case by case basis. Uh, but in general, my preference is to go with the best. I think that's a great place to close. So let, let me hand it off to you. If, if anybody's interested in following you or learning more about you or the book or your firm, where, where should they go to find that stuff? Sure. Uh, you, know, you Google Woodhouse, a Woodlock House, uh, Family Capital. I write an occasional blog on the website. Uh, and then I'm on Twitter, Chris W. Mayer, M-A-Y-E-R. So you can follow me there. And uh, yeah, so that's that's how you follow what I do. And of course, you can find the book on Amazon if you're interested in reading it, uh, which is yeah. how I got it. So yep. uh, Chris, this has been awesome. Thank you yeah, so much for doing, taking the time. And, um, I'm really sure. interested to hear all your thoughts. Appreciate it. Great questions. And thank you. Enjoyed the conversation. That's it for our show today. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. We recognize that you have a lot of different podcast choices, and we appreciate you spending the time with us. We are continually working to make the show better, and we would love your feedback. The more candid and honest, the better. And if you have any suggestions for public company CEOs you would like to see on the podcast, please let us know. And of course, warm intros are always appreciated. Please feel free to email us at podcast at costreetcapital.com with your comments or suggestions. Thanks again, and stay tuned for the next episode of Compounders, Anatomy of a Multibiker.